Uh, well, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, we do appreciate the interest in the topic and as well, uh, we we hope this gives opportunity to have a, a lively discussion at the end. Uh, before going into topic, I think it would be nice if we present each other and talk a little bit about uh, our backgrounds. So uh, Beth, if you if you can go ahead. Sure. Um, so uh, my name's Beth Reddy. I'm at the, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm an assistant professor of engineering design and society um, with an affiliation in geophysics at the Colorado School of Mines, where I serve as the associate director of our humanitarian engineering and science graduate program. Um, there, I'll note that a lot of my work, I am trained as a cultural anthropologist, right? Especially, um, I specialize in environmental anthropology and in science and technology studies. But a lot of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is think about collaboration and, and project building sort of outside of academic spaces or alongside of other academic spaces sort of less traditionally occupied by um, academic anthropologists. Um, so um, I am incredibly excited to present some of this work that I had a chance to do with, um, with Gloria and um, to talk through um, some of the maybe things that bring us to work like this and the kind of um, opportunities and, and limitations that, that Gloria and I both see in our research and, and activism and, um, and practice around these themes. Thank you, Matt. Uh, so I'm Gloria Muñoz. I'm uh, I am a PhD candidate in planning and environmental management at the University of Manchester. I'm originally from Mexico, from Tijuana, which is uh, the region or the city uh, associated with with the project that we're going to talk about next. In my work currently, I work uh, on the topic of uh, climate change adaptation in under resourced communities. It, within the in the in the context of the global south, but more specifically in Mexico, in a tourist center city uh, with with high levels of of um, poverty, urban poverty, uh, which something that is interested interesting for me as a moment in this moment is that uh, Beth and I have become friends, good friends over the years, and I've just no understood you know how this our kindred spirit part uh has found each other because we both work within the social sciences in uh other disciplines right she's a cultural anthropologist working in an engineering school i'm a um originally clinical psychology psychologist trained in community psychology who works around urban planning and environmental studies ever since I, I graduated from my bachelor. So we find ourselves working in, in with in collaboration alongside and within communities of, of, of knowledge and practice that are not where we originally started. And I think that is a is a great asset for us in how we look at the at the topics that we research, but also how we in our everyday activities engage with with other with other researchers and and, and colleagues and and people around our our working networks, um, so if if you allow me, I will start. I think I can yes, uh, start the presentation. So uh, this is the content or what we will try to go through in the next uh, forty minutes with you guys, starting with the the introduction to the topic and obviously going through. Uh, what our framework was, what was the situation, what we found, and and some things that we we hope we can discuss uh, in this meeting today. So first, well, earthquakes, right? This is the topic or the the research that we will present or the paper that we're presenting today is around research of earthquakes. So a broad definition, you already probably know it, but we we are talking about when the tectonic plates uh, move too much within a fault. They they liberate some energy, and we feel it as this 
um, abrupt and dramatic shaking in the ground, right? Uh, because of the nature of earthquakes, uh, we we don't focus as much, or in earthquake research, we don't focus as much on early warning because they are, uh, earthquakes are known to be unpredictable. Um, what is in the literature is that the the um, the risk associated or the damage that can be caused by an earthquake is going to be um, explained by one the magnitude of the earthquake and two an interesting bit the level of readiness and the capacity of each in this case uh, as the United Nations puts it, the national capacity to respond. Our research is within uh, the, the Circum Pacific Belt, uh, as you can see in, in the map to your right, which is also known as the Ring of Fire. Uh, this is because I think of around, estimates say around 90% of the seismic and, and volcano activity uh, happens along this line. We are focused on, we're going to focus on the uh, one particular fault within the, the border of California and Baja California, that is the northwest part of, of Mexico. Um, why is this important to say, well, most of the earthquakes and, uh, and the ones that have been more damaging occur in the southern bit of the American um, continent. However, vulnerability to it or the damages are, are not only associated with the probability of occurrence, but with the capacity of each um, socio ecosystem to, to, to withstand it and to recover from it, right? So in this particular area, and we will discuss it in detail in the following slides, in this particular area, what is, what makes it an interesting case study, and I apologize for the use of interesting, is the compounding forms of marginalization. Uh, so in this border reg region, what we find is that there are um, overlapping layers of vulnerability that um, make this a, 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 an important area to research in regards, again, to earthquake risk. Uh, to set an example, in 2010, uh, there was a big uh, earthquake of, of 77.2 magnitude, not in, uh, in another fault, which is the San Andreas Fault. And um, it, the epicenter was in the Mexican side in Mexicali, Baja California. The government estimates that obviously a lot of people were affected. There were a lot of injuries. There were families that were forced to relocate, but uh, what for me is most important to say to contextualize the importance of this region or studying risk for earthquakes and investing in preparedness is that the mid and long term effects of, uh, of, of this and the limited capacities we have to, to handle in the situation. In this case, a lot of roads were damaged. Uh, especially in rural areas around the Mexican side, uh, because of the nature of the um, earthquake and the movement, a lot of the the crop sixty um, hectares 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 I don't know how to say it sixty thousand hectares of of of, of planted uh, I think it was wheat uh, was completely lost. And because of contamination and other and other things that were after uh, that happened in the aftermath of the of the earthquake, uh, many many parts of of the agricultural land in Mexicali were deemed as unusable for a long time after. This also obviously has impacts in the in the food production um, chain. It had impact on other. Um, livelihoods in the region. So, for example, people who depended on the wheat to feed their cattle and their and their other animals. So, it is again those those things that are those vulnerabilities that are um, that come to an intersection when when discussing the topic. Um, so now about production of knowledge around 
uh, earthquake, right? So what is the um, baseline for studying, talking, um, and working around the topic of, of earthquakes and earthquake preparedness or disaster risk reduction is the Sendai framework for, for this, for the DRR, right? Um, this is something that has been used, especially in, in Latin America, is the, the, the key tool for, for uh, working on policy and programs uh, on the topic, right? And importantly to us and to what we are presenting today is one of the six priorities set by the Sendai framework, which is understanding risk. Uh, in this specifically, no, not specifically, in this, uh, in this priority, explicitly is the word that we're looking for. Explicitly, it is stated that uh, it is important to make sure that we produce knowledge around, like we continue to, to study risk and that we make sure that we are able to translate that knowledge, that scientific knowledge into actions, into policy. So in this sense, in prior in this sense, I'm sorry, priority number one is building the knowledge, but also making sure that the that the knowledge is understandable to us, to 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 all, and that it is shared and that it's transparent. So again, a lot of a, a lot of emphasis on uh, building knowledge and sharing knowledge. Uh, in that sense, and again, because we, we don't focus as much on early warning systems, what is a big focus is the long-term uh, reduction of, of risk, working on not creating more risk, but also reducing the existing risk. And it is done mostly by looking at um, technical and quantitative approaches. So mapping the risk and uh, yeah, hazard mapping, mapping the risk and 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 analyzing quanti quantitative predicting damage mostly. Uh, there are many tools I've, I've put this no uh, seismic vulnerability modeling, quantitative resilience assessment, among others. The important thing about this or why we've we've spelled that out in this slide is that this you can imagine requires a lot of resources. Anything around these type of instruments that are known or preferred as a way to inform decision-making or as a way to uh, produce programs and projects uh, requires a lot of human capital, but also cultural capital. Knowledge around these areas, knowledge around software, ability to, to to purchase that software or licenses, big chunks of data, quantitative data uh, around, around buildings, around uh, legislations, um, and obviously field work. You know, you, for some regions, and especially considering, again, the Global North and Global South divide, what we will find is that in the Global South, we there is a tendency, uh, well, it is common that this information doesn't exist. So for the people in the global south and for researchers specifically, this is data that has to be produced. Um, so it's not it's on the one hand producing the data, on the other hand, systemizing, systemizing it, systematizing it, I think, systematizing it, and uh, making sure that this fits an international language, you know, those commonalities, those terms, that we use within the the academy. So a lot of resources have to be invested to be able to uh, produce the knowledge uh, as it's framed within this, this guideline. And uh, again, obviously that will entail different different challenges in different in, in different locations and different groups of, of researchers and experts and uh, populations. So it is with that in mind that we can make a connection directly to environmental justice topics and uh, specifically thinking about the concept of politics of difference you know how do we uh, how do we look at that at that differentiation between between groups with the, within individuals and how do we make that no, how do we acknowledge those differences 
and how they are made to matter, how they're integrated and how we understand um, a, 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 any, any, ah, sorry, there we go. Um, how we understand um, the, the, the research that we're doing. Um, I can't see my slides because of the view and I keep trying to hide it, but give me a moment. There we go. I've had, I've hidden it. So, um, for, uh, for studying or for, for the paper that we, um, uh, wrote together with, uh, other two colleagues, we've integrated this, um, the concept of environmental justice, obviously, um acknowledging the the background the theory around um distributal procedural and recognitional justice but we've decided to focus on on recognitional justice specifically because this allows us the opportunity to look at how these uh differences have an effect on the production of of, of knowledge and specifically because we're looking at uh, the lack of recognition uh, in some settings um, that have an effect on how we understand the problem and how, as a result, we elaborate or develop solutions and proposals around it. So, uh, again, uh, using the, the, the framework of environmental justice, we're looking at recognition of justice to to see how we handle the differences in the in the affected group, not only in the affected groups, but in this case, in uh, those those groups that are um, that are, I guess, made responsible for X or Y reasons uh, to study to study the topic, and. Uh, one of the particular or another particularity of, of how we've looked at our research is thinking around participation. So in environmental justice frameworks, uh, traditionally, I guess, uh, most of the research focuses on distributive aspects, right? And this is also very, very common to see that it, that it is focused around the distribution of, of of risks or, or or harm or damage and the distribution of benefits and goods, right? And then we have the procedural aspect of it, of, of how we, we set up the participation of people. And uh, in, in the quote that you see in the screen, what, what you see is that it is not only of it, it is not only about having those spaces for people to participate, but also how do we understand participation? How would, do we interpret participation? Is it only that everybody has to have a say or are we enabling uh, spaces where people can, not, can go further and have an impact and that have the equal opportunities for those voices and those perspectives to be heard um, and, and that the differences are made to be an asset in our understanding and not a, a challenge. And now we can start with, uh, with, with, with the specifics of, of the case study that we're presenting today. And I think that's my cue. Um, <clears throat> right, so um, this has all been conceptual, right? This framework that we've given you. Um, and you might uh, you might think that this is this purely lives in the land of concepts, right? Um, question, maybe I'm I'm getting too used to working with with engineers and applied scientists, but a question that I often get asked is is so what, right? Well, um, as we walk you through this case, we can tell you what it means to think about, um, critical approaches to environmental justice and issues of knowledge production in this way. Um, so we're going to focus on this particular um, this particular scenario 
um, that was developed in um, starting largely in um, 2015, although work was probably going long before then, um, that I was involved with at least between 2015 and 2019. So um, in case you're not familiar, scenario work is crucial to a lot of disaster risk reduction programs. Um, it allows us to kind of game out what might happen if an event, um, a, a, a undesirable event occurs. It allows um, different kinds of disciplinary um, folks uh, or and people oriented towards this kind of this kind of event to to conceptualize um, a uh, an event and like really practically think about okay what happens then what happens then what happens then um, so in 2015 um, both Gloria and myself became involved in this uh, this kind of work around uh, a fault called the Rose Canyon Fault. Um, this is a kind of newly characterized fault that seems um, San Diego, but has real practical implications for both California and for Mexico. Um, so the meetings that, that kicked off attention to this um, fault um, and to the, the um, San Diego, Tijuana regions um, really started out being multinational, right? Because faults don't pay attention to national boundaries. Um, and because these two regions are deeply intertwined, their um, economies, the daily lives of people who live in them, right? Like the, we might call these two different nations and certainly the, the sort of national regulation spaces um, have like implicate different implications for different people who live there. Um, but but we really um, were talking about um, a binational conditions of, of, of risk. And that's what drew us in, right? These, these meetings um, were characterized, were co coordinated by the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, which is a US-based nonprofit technical society that's kind of focused on reducing earthquake risk through techno-scientific advancement and public outreach and policy development. Um, and they partnered with Radius, which is a Tijuana-based group. Um, it's been um, working towards providing practical tools for seismic risk man management um, ever since um, 1999. So together, um, these groups and, and others sort of brought to bear a shifting set of collaborators to produce a scenario that they hoped would um, address current regional needs and help open up further conversation into practical uh, issues related to planning. Um, no, no communities or stakeholder groups were directly discussed in early mission statements. Instead, they highlight these mission statements highlighted the potential to produce a vision for a seismically resilient, um, well, seismically resilient San Diego. And we're going to talk about that. So um, the core group of scenario contributors comprised at first roughly a dozen experts based in both California and Baja California, um, who might be more or less active depending on the phase of the project. Um, and this beautiful piece of art you're looking at is, um, is called bor Borada, it's called Erasure, um, or perhaps I'm, I'm, uh, I haven't translated the tense entirely correctly, but um, it draws attention to the border between the US and Mexico and how quite early on um, <clears throat> uh, projects were sort of the, 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 the sort of processes behind this scenario project um, undertaken by, um, by uh, like geoscientists and um, specifically um, were able to, to render seismic effects along the rupture potential seismic effects along the rupture of a, a Rose Canyon fault, um, as if they were erasing a US-Mexico border. Um, in fact, that's what um, someone told me in an interview, I can just erase the border. That's approaching this border 
as uh, between nations as if it's just a layer on a map, right? I can just get rid of that. I'm in GIS. I can I could bring in some things. I can take out some things, and that was like a very practical. Um, a very practical reality for for some people working on this project. It was as if the border didn't exist because we were talking about physical effects. But of course, as we move further along into this project, um, questions about border erasure were not so easy. So this this image you are looking at now is a is a kind of famous one that's been taken up in a lot of media. It shows the fence along the San Diego Tijuana border, and you can see the the San Diego side is um, I think there's some some golf course there. There's some park there, um, and uh, and in Tijuana there's this dense urban space. Like the border does matter, um, and the border doesn't just matter for. Um, for for uh for physical structures but it 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 matters uh, more than that certainly imagining physical structures though was a moment at which working group two now which was attempting to develop analysis for the structural effects of ground motion started to you know really realize the implications of this border border seamed space um so they uh, first off, um, wanted to use a free to them um, uh, t uh, software for estimating the ground motion and its effects on on earthquake uh, and its effects on various um, various kinds of structures and populations. It's called Hazos. It's very common to work use this in the United States. We use it for a lot of um, est early estimation things around earthquakes. The thing is um, that did provide some data for um, the San Diego team to work with, but it did little to help our collaborators in Tijuana, right? No software like Hazus with um, basic building stock information already uploaded existed in Mexico. This is something that um, people had to develop and leaders of the um, project based in Tijuana were um, tried to use an analogous open source tool but they needed to upload all that information themselves. Creating compatibility with Hazus required at least a year's worth of assessment and database creation. And with no funding to support their work, projects slowed considerably. And this is an important moment to talk about funding. So this project um, was um, originally conceptualized like this, right? The earth science it feeds into the engineering, which feeds into the social science, which can feed into the policy. And all of this can um, take place as a bi-national um, project to adequately really render the experience of, of this regional space where, where conditions in the Tijuana region in Mexico deeply inform conditions in um, the in San Diego and the in the U.S. and and vice versa. These these um, we really do talk about a conurbation where um, you know these cities grew up together and have become what they are together and continue to 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 um, to rely on each other. But um, this but this whole project was sort of envisioned and funded from the U.S. from EERI and so um, bringing on social scientists like myself, and um, envisioning funding us, which they did to some extent, was really easy. The decision to use um, Hazus was really easy. But what was happening on the Mexican quote unquote side of the project, not the same thing. The same kinds of resources were not made available. Um, and this really became an issue as we developed our, our this information for working group three, which was meant to focus on social and economic impact of the scenario earthquake. Um, working group two was started to look to our results to better understand what might um, be key areas to consider in terms of in terms of building stock. But after long debate, um, the working group was directed to conduct focus groups with key institutions based in San Diego rather than try to engage across the border. So now you have funded researchers or rather, or practitioners 
um, working mainly on, on San Diego while um, the underfunded researchers have to do more labor in Tijuana to attempt to catch up. So the idea of um, using this scenario to kind of spread awareness of um, seismic hazard was really, really persuasive to, to all of us. Um, however, uh, and, and it was really persuasive to, um, to members of, um, of the Mexican and San Diego-based community. Um, when I spoke to um, members of the Mexican community, they said, you know, anything we could do to, um, to continue to bring focus to these issues was, would be um, super, super valuable. However, right? Um, and there were always people willing to participate. Can you advance the next slide? Tijuana was just more remote from the epicenter of the study. And as the, the project went on, this methodological nationalism, that is what we've characterized to, to describe how um, the everyday decisions that were made um, by the, the funding initiators who launched a binational study and who targeted um, areas in, in you know, actually areas not just in San Diego, but in Tijuana for needing the most attention, um, for being the most vulnerable to seismic effects. These, these decisions produce the conditions of possibility in which information about, about Tijuana, about Mexico broadly, just couldn't be included. Can you move one slide on? So um, this was, as I, um, as I interviewed people later on, as the study was, was wrapping up, um, everyone saw the attrition of our Mexican collaborators. And someone commented on one Mexican participant who is a co-author on this article and here with us, um, reflecting she's just not involved in the project because she doesn't have the bandwidth between teaching and doing all the teaching she needs to do to make enough money to live because salaries are much lower in, um, in Mexico than, than our salaries in, in, uh, in the U.S. are. Like, so there's this acknowledgement we can see very clearly in data we collected um, from people who are participating in the project, the yeah, conditions in, in Mexico and the US are different and those might have impacts on how people, the, the real collaborators that we really once had in, um, in Tijuana could participate, could create knowledge about Tijuana with um, real impact. Nonetheless, nonetheless, this project continued. So um, thank you. Uh, by the end of this project, right, when a report was released in 2020, um, the, 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 the official word was, you know, team members engaged Mexican partners to identify and analyze impacts to infrastructure and challenges to emergency response for earthquakes. Let's, let's note that, right? The Mexican partners are not team members, right? They're, they're partners. Unfortunately, the Tijuana analysis just was not complete at the time of this report release. Now, I will note that I shared um, this uh, paper that we wrote with, our, uh, with, with people who continue to be involved in this project. And they like me to say that, hey, we're still doing work on this project. This project is ongoing. Um, I have not seen any ongoing material results. Um, and certainly uh, this, um, this concern is something that they, we might imagine could be rectified, but it wasn't and it hasn't been. Um, so yeah, I think let's, uh, let's talk about kind of outcomes. Uh, Gloria, do you want to take this? Great, thank you, Beth. Um, so uh, as as we've been, been through the presentation, we've looked at what what it was our framing and understanding, right? And something that is important to say is that um, this 
uh, paper that we're discussing today is, is the, the product of, of participant observation um, because as, as Beth has already told you, we were both in the project in different stages of it. And uh, having now the narrative about what happened and what was the outcome that uh, in clear English language, the outcome was that the Tijuana side, the, 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 the border scenario, the binational border scenario was at the end uh, not binational. It mostly describes uh, the San Diego, the San Diego region, uh, city uh, or county, and um, uh, the part about Mexico was um, shoved to the side. So, in in going back to the framework of environmental justice, we have you know what what are the what what are the outcomes? Where the the outcomes is that we have a partial answer to our research question, right? And in this sense, uh, for an earthquake uh, scenario like the one we are discussing, this has implications for both sides of the border, not only for the Mexican sides. And uh, having having reflected as a group between the people who wrote the paper, we can see uh, that, clear, uh, that this is a clear evidence or a clear example of how the systemic inequities that help us explain risk and hazard to uh, to some um, disasters. I, I I struggle. I, I don't want to say natural disasters, but I guess in 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 this case, to to natural events that can end up as a disaster also permeate in how in the research uh, systems. So these inequities that we see in everyday life and that explain the topics that we as researchers research also inform the production of knowledge around those rigs, right? So in that, what are the, what are the, in that recognitional justice framework, we, we know what, what are the values that were privileged? Well, in this case, the values that were privileged were around the territory, around infrastructure, the information that is available, pragmatism, what are we able to publish um, and what is more readily accessible instead of focusing on or maybe integrating the aspect about people and the environment, because as Beth has um, said previously, the 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 fault goes throughout the region and it doesn't un understand or pay attention to national borders. So uh, to wrap up, uh, we think that this is an important uh, topic to continue to reflect upon and that as practitioners, uh, we have to uh, take into consideration when we are working in research, what are the resources that are available and to whom? And how we can how can we make sure that we use those resources as best possible uh, uh, to create opportunity for that knowledge production? That everybody, it's not only about having a seat at the table, but also that at the end, your voice is also integrated into the understanding. And that means respect and acknowledgement. So uh, to, to, to sum up, we believe that uh, as researchers, we should be working on being advocates for change within the, the systems of, pra of research practice that we are part of. And that means advocating for equitable participation and representation. And that's it from our side. Um, Beth and I thought that it, it would be interesting. Um, obviously, we will uh, look forward to any questions or clarifications that, that the audience might want. But we also want to hear from you guys. So we prepared two little questions to open up a discussion if, if, if there's time for that. And as we close, we should also make sure to thank Sasha and Lisa and everybody here at uh, um, the Group for Critical Environmental Psychology for inviting us to, to speak and for being willing to engage with these issues. Um, we do other kinds of work. Um, I think that you can see our links to some of our work here. I've written, um, I have a recent book out about, um, about earthquakes and about Mexico. And um, and I know that Gloria is putting together some more amazing work about um, 
people living with with other kinds of hazards like climate change. Um, but so these things are things we have been thinking about, right? And so we invite you to share what you've been thinking about, about practical resources you've identified to practice relationality and responsibility um, in, in better ways than, than we usually do, or um, about how this moment of climate crisis and late industrialism might allow us to see, enact, and respond to issues we identify here in new ways. Thank you.